this, other webinars that let people learn about the project asynchronously. So we've got a lot of good resources up there and we'll be releasing some educational videos up on that channel as well in the next year. So we should be recording. You probably got a ping about that. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. And, and we will get started. So I, like I said, I'm the director of Bud Burst. We are a community science project based at the Chicago Botanic Garden. But as you probably know, you can participate from anywhere in the US and actually anywhere in the world. So today, this is our general webinar. Um, we will be going over our projects. Uh, we right now have three main research projects, so we will talk about that. Uh, and we will also talk about our program as an educational resource. We'll discuss what it means to be a partner with Bud Burst, and we'll go over a little bit of our technology and how to make an observation. And we will leave time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have questions, uh, we will get to them. Don't worry. All right, lovely. Seeing some responses in the chat. Great to have you all here. Awesome to have a partner. That's great perspective. Okay, lovely. Let's get going. So like I said, Budverse is a community science project and we bring together researchers, educators, and of course our community scientists to answer ecological questions, primarily by studying the timing of seasonal changes in plants. Although at Budverse in the last few years, we have also expanded our research, not just to seasonal changes in plants, but now we also have projects focused on plants and animals and how they interact with each other, some of which we'll talk about today. So community science is public involvement in inquiry and the discovery of new scientific knowledge. And you may have heard folks use the terms citizen science. There's also other terms like participatory science, neighborhood science. We like to use the term community science. And essentially, uh, you may have heard those many different terms. Oftentimes they're used interchangeably. We use community science here at Bud Burst. And what it means to be a community science project is that anyone can participate in the project. So you do not have to be a scientist. You don't have to be an expert in plants or biology or science at all. It's open to anyone, younger learners, adult learners of all ages. And then the other tenant is that all of the data that we collect are free and publicly available for anyone to use. So the data that you contribute is a fantastic way to participate but people can also participate in the project by looking at the data, using the data. You can look at your data in our database and you can look at data across the country or internationally as well. And it's free for anyone to use, whether you might be a research scientist or maybe you're a high school biology teacher or just a person who is interested in asking your own questions. So free and open and available for everybody. And the majority of the work that Budburst has done since we started in 2007 has been on phenology. Now, this word may be new to some of you, but I guarantee you're familiar with the idea of it. So phenology is the study of the timing of seasonal changes in plants and animals, although at Budburst we mostly study plants. Now, for this study of phenology, really all that it means is that we are looking at seasonal changes. We're looking at seasonal changes in plants. So this might mean looking at flowers blossoming in, blossoming in the spring or leaf color change in the fall. So it's a phenomenon that most people are familiar with, whether you've just noticed it casually. And what we do at Budburst is we ask people to pay attention to those changes and to record them either on your phone or on your computer, a computer and send that information to us. So we collect those data across the country and internationally to help us answer questions about how plants are being impacted by climate change. So this is an example of what looking at phenology or different phenophases, phases of phenology in a plant might look like. Um, here, we're looking at a silver maple and essentially for studying phenology, all we're asking people to do is to look at various different plant parts. So you might look at the flowers, you might look at the leaves, and you might look at the fruits. Relatively 
easy to understand. A lot of those different plant parts, some people have familiar with familiarity with already. And for some of these plants that we're looking at, the plant parts might be different. And we'll talk a little bit about that in more in depth in uh, an upcoming slide. So we're looking at plants and we're looking at each different plant part and we're just asking, what is that plant part doing? What are the flowers doing in April? What are the flowers doing in September? So that's an example of how we might collect this phenological data. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So why are we focused on phenology? Why does this matter? Plant phenology or plant seasonal change can tell us about a lot of different things. So it might be important for when we are planting or harvesting crops. It can also tell us about the severity and the timing of seasonal allergies, and it can be used to help us manage invasive species. But the main reason we're looking at it at Budburst is because it helps us understand and predict the impacts of climate change. So we know that our spring-like temperatures are happening earlier and earlier in the calendar year than what we've seen historically. So this means that spring-like temperatures that we might have seen in April, we might see a few days earlier in the calendar year. And that's just an example. So we're seeing spring-like temperatures happening earlier and earlier. And that means that the things that happen in spring happen earlier because they are responding to temperature. So this might mean that our plants are getting their flower buds and their blossoms earlier than we've seen historically. And now I'm not sure where everybody here lives. I live in Chicago. So off the top of our heads, we might think, oh, an earlier spring, that doesn't sound so bad. I'd love to have an earlier spring. And it might sound nice to us uh, because we have a little bit of temperature control in our hands, but this can have unanticipated impacts for our plants and also for pollinators. So if we have our blossoms coming out earlier in the calendar year, they might be exposed to things like a late season frost or winter storms that are still going to happen. Even if we have, let's say, a really warm day in early March, it's very likely that we might still get freezing temperatures happening later in March or maybe even in April. And if that's the case, these flower blossoms that have already opened up are quite vulnerable and they might uh, be impacted by those winter storms. They might uh, shrivel up, fall off the tree. They might not be able to continue to live out the life that they would otherwise as a blossom on that plant. And that's going to impact pollinators because they need those flower blossoms. And it also has an impact on fruit production because our flower blossoms, once they're pollinated, that is going to lead to fruit production. So we study plants at Budburst, but the reason that we study plants is because they are connected to everything else. So they are the base of all of our ecosystems. We have plants connected to pollinators. Plants are resources for birds and other organisms. And they are part of this food supply for people as well. So we are a part of this ecosystem too. We're not separate from it. So at Budburst, we're studying plants, but we're doing it partly because it gives us a lens into the broader ecosystem and patterns that are happening widely. So like I mentioned a little bit up top, today we're going to talk about a few different areas. We are going to talk about Budburst research projects. By the end of this talk, you'll be ready to start on any one of those projects. We'll also talk about Budburst as an educational resource, uh, both in schools or for families. And we'll talk about technology, so the way that you can add a Budburst observation and some of the tools we have at our disposal. So first we will talk about our research projects and we categorize our projects into long-term and short-term projects. We will go through each of these. I will spend the least amount of time on our native ours project, that last bullet point there, partly because that project is winding down. So I'll mention it so you're aware of it, but it's probably the least likely one that you'd participate in. Okay, so we have already been talking about phenology. 
Our phenology and climate project is the core of Budburst. This is what Budburst has been doing since 2007. This is our largest data set and it is really our bread and butter. This is the majority of what we do. And it's also our most easy and accessible project for folks to participate in. So this is the project where you'll be tracking seasonal changes in plants. And you can do this project from on any plant at any location. So it is in that way very open-ended for anyone to participate anywhere. And I mean anywhere. You can do this observation anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to just be in the US. And it can be on any plant. So we have folks that have made observations on dandelions. So if you're in a very urban area and you think you might not have access to enough plants to participate, that's not the case. Anybody can do this project, whatever you've got access to. We do ask that the plants are outside plants, so we don't do it with indoor plants. And the majority of our plants are going to be um, wildflowers or trees. And we don't have folks do observations on veggies very much. So like crop plants is not quite what this project is focused on, but we'll get into more of that on the next slide. So you can participate in this project in very casual ways or much more intensive ways if you're interested. Uh, for instance, if you, are, if you have a plant in your backyard, like you have a backyard cherry tree and you see that plant every single morning, you could track that plant throughout the entire year and tell us when it, it hits every single one of its phenophases. When you've got your buds, your flowers, when the leaves come out, when the leaves fall, everything throughout the year. And that's amazing. That's really valuable information for us. But if you don't want to participate that often or that intensively, you can also participate really casually. So if you're just on a walk in your neighborhood or you're on a hike in a place that you may never return to, but you see an interesting flower blossom, you can just snap a picture and send us that one data point. You don't have to revisit that plant over and over again. So you can either participate casually, where it's just one-off observations of plants you see that are interesting to you, or you can track the same plant over the course of a year or multiple years, depending on how often you're with that plant. And then I wanted to show an example of the way that we collect data on these different plant parts, like I mentioned a little bit in the introduction. So for some of our plants, the plant parts we're looking at are flowers, fruits, and leaves. And we have these visual wheels to highlight the way that a plant might change throughout a calendar year. So in a cyclical pattern, this is what you might see. You might see in the flower area, Maybe over the winter there are no flowers and then you start to see the first bud come out and then that bud will burst open and then we have a first flower. So you can see the pattern throughout the year. And you'll just answer these questions for each different plant part. What are the flowers doing when you look at the plant? What are the fruits doing? What are the leaves doing? Um, so, sorry, my video keeps blinking on and off. So I it may flick off and then I'll just try to pop back on if I notice it. Um, so you'll look at each of these different plant parts throughout the year and you'll give us information in that way. And at Budburst, we group our plants into five different plant groups. And these are grouped mostly by the different types of uh, phenophases or plant parts that you might be looking at. So for wildflowers and herbs and deciduous trees and shrubs, you might be looking at the flowers, the fruits and the leaves like we've been talking about. But for conifers, you won't see the same plant parts. So for conifers, you'll give us information on needles and cones and pollen. So depending on the plant group that the plant you're observing is in, you might see different plant parts and you might see different wheels, but you'll always see those wheel visuals related to the plant parts that you should expect to see on the plant you're looking at. The majority of people make observations on wildflowers and herbs and deciduous trees and shrubs. Those tend to be quite common. A lot of people can identify some of those species as they're walking around their neighborhood or maybe in their own garden. 
and the plant parts are recognizable as well. So your flowers, your leaves, a lot of people are familiar with those parts and it's a pretty easy and accessible entry point into the project. But if you have expertise in grasses, we'd of course love to have your grass observations as well. Uh, okay, so that's our phenology project. I'll answer any questions about it when we get to the end of this talk, but I wanna highlight our other projects as well. So our pollinators and climate project is intended to be a long-term project, but we did start this only recently when Budburst came to the Chicago Botanic Garden in 2017. And for this project, you're going to still collect some information on your plant, the plant flowering stage. So we're always collecting a little bit of phenology information. And then we are asking folks to track pollinator visitation to a flowering plant. So what we recommend is that people watch a plant for about 10 minutes. You don't have to do 10 minutes, but it's a good frame of reference, just a small chunk of time. And you'll essentially sit nearby enough that you can watch the plant, but not so close that you bother the pollinators. And then you'll see what pollinators visit the flowers of that plant uh, as you're watching it. We recommend doing this on plants where you can see the entire plant. So this isn't as great of a project for trees because trees are so big, you wouldn't be able to see all of the different pollinators at once. Better for our wildflowers and herbs and plants that you see uh, that you can watch the entire plant in one setting. And then for this project, there are three different levels of participation and that varies depending on your pollinator ID skills. So at our basic level, all you have to do is distinguish between butterflies and moths, birds and bees, that's it. So this project is really great if you want to do something with pollinators, but you might not have pollinator ID skills yet, that's totally fine. Or maybe you're doing this with a younger learner, they're interested in it, but they might not have pollinator ID skills either. So this is also pretty accessible for students and our younger learners as well, distinguishing between those three categories. If you do have more pollinator ID skills, you can participate at the advanced or the expert level, and then you'll distinguish between more of those pollinator species. But any level of participation is helpful, uh, any, really any information for this project, partly because it's so new, we don't have as much data for this. So if this is of interest to you, we'd love to have you contribute. And again, happy to answer more questions about this as well. And the last project that I'll spend a ton of time on is our Milkweeds and Monarchs project. This project is focused on milkweed plants and monarch butterflies, and we're asking a relatively specific question here. We're asking whether monarch butterflies prefer to lay their eggs on flowering or non-flowering milkweed stems. So what we ask people to do for this project is to observe milkweed plants, document the flowering stage, so that little piece of phenology information, you're just distinguishing between early, middle, or late flowering for those plants. And then you'll look at the plants, usually on the undersides of the leaves, checking for monarch eggs and monarch caterpillars. And you can see in the graphic in the bottom left corner, an example of what that might look like. The eggs are quite small. Hopefully you can see the little label and the small dot next to it. They're about the size of the tip of a pencil. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for eggs and we're also looking for caterpillars, which are often much larger, easier to spot. And for bud burst, all you have to do is differentiate between caterpillars in their smallest stage, which in that uh, same graphic is labeled as number one, versus anything larger than number one. So that's the only differentiation you have to make between those various different caterpillar sizes. We do for this project also have an advanced level of participation in which you would distinguish between those five different sizes all separately. But you don't have to participate at that level. All you have to do for bud burst is count the eggs and count the caterpillars and tell us if they're that smallest version, that labeled number one, or anything larger than that. Those different caterpillars are different instar stages, which is just means different uh, growth phases for the caterpillar. 
So this is our Milkweeds and Monarchs project. And now if you participate in this project, we also work in collaboration with the Field Museum, which is based in Chicago, where if you collect data at the advanced level, distinguishing between all of those different caterpillar growth stages, the Field Museum can use those data as well. So it helps both projects. And then the other piece I want to mention about Milkweeds and Monarchs is that this is what a lot of our in-person programming has been focused on in Chicago. And through a couple of generous foundation grants, we've also been able to do some really important work connected to this project. So with some funding from the Walder Foundation, we were able to translate our website and all of our education materials into Spanish. So now we have all of our materials available in English and Spanish. That's on the website, the educational materials, and the phone mobile app, which we'll talk more about. And for the work that we do locally in Chicago, we partner with the Chicago Public Library System, as well as community organizations based in Chicago. Uh, so this is a lot of what we do over the summertime. We have garden days with these organizations, and we install milkweed gardens, and we teach people in person we do trainings like this, but a little bit more hands-on because we're all together. And we'll look at milkweed plants and try to find eggs, try to find caterpillars and do a training just like this, uh, but all together. The last project I'll mention, which I won't go into too much detail on, is our Native Ours project. The reason why I won't go into too much detail is because this project is coming to a close. Uh, we are, uh, collecting data really just this spring and one more fall, and that will be the end of data collection for the Native Ours project. And for this project, we're asking the specific question, do Native Ours, which are cultivated varieties of native plants, attract as many pollinators as their wild type or true native relatives? And you can see an example of how these plants differ in these images. The false indigo picture on the far left is the wild type native, and the three other pictures are cultivated varieties of that native, also called native ours. So you can see they look quite different. And what we're doing with this project is seeing whether pollinators visit these plants at different frequencies. Uh, this project uh, is partly requires a bit of setup. So that's why I don't expect too many people to do this project because you have to have both the native plants and the cultivated varieties. So it's a little bit more intensive. If you are very interested in this, talk to me at the end and, and we can talk about it, but it is winding down and it's a pretty intense setup. But this is a project that we have been doing and um, hopefully we'll have some information that we're releasing in the next year talking about what we found from the project. Okay, so those are our research projects. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about Bud Burst as an educational program. And these are just a handful of different ways that Bud Burst can be used for educational purposes. Um, it can be really wonderful for outdoor learning opportunities for students, practicing real world data collection so students can actually collect data themselves and enter those data as well. It's a way to teach place-based climate change education. So very often when we learn about climate change, the examples that we're given are quite far away. Think polar bears, ice caps, that's pretty far removed from our lives, from the lives of students. But learning about bud burst and how we can look at plants in our backyard to learn about how they're being impacted by climate change is a way for us to get that educational information in our own locales, wherever you may be, you can look at plants being impacted by climate change yourself. So it's a way to learn about climate change and have it be more localized. It's also a great way to learn about a real science project and how to do a real science project that um, data collection can be messy. There's not always a clear answer. It's a way for complicated scientific concepts to be a little bit more real for students. And it's a great way for them to do uh, independent projects as well. So Budburst, as an educational tool, what we do, our staff does, we hold educator trainings and professional development sessions 
oftentimes we're working locally with Chicago-based schools uh, for those activities. But sometimes we do hold general educator webinars. So if you're interested in that or have folks that might be interested in that, please do let me know at the end of this call and we can put you on our educators email list. So people get those informations when we do general professional development for educators. We also have curriculum and activities. These are for anyone, anywhere. So these are just up on our website. They are free and publicly available. We have curriculum and family activities for students K through 12, as well as higher education. So if you're an educator, if there are educators in your life that are looking for resources, please think about Budburst. It's a great project to teach a variety of different subjects, uh, plants, pollinators, plant animal interactions, gardening, environment, ecosystems, climate change, the list goes on and on. We also do local student facing programs in Chicago. So we go to Chicago public schools, we plant gardens with the students, and then they're able to use those gardens for their curriculum, whether that is any of the topics I just listed or making actual bud burst observations on the gardens that are now on their school's site. We also in um, 2021 had a partnership with Scholastic, which was targeted towards grades three through eight, so some of our younger learners, but they were able to build some really great um, activities using Budburst, but with all of the power behind Scholastic, which was really wonderful. And this is a little bit more information about some of the curriculum that we have. So like I mentioned, we have curriculum for pre-K through higher ed. If you go into our website, uh, you'll be able to see activities for educators. All of it is nested under there and it is broken down by grades. So depending on the grades that you're interested in, you'll see what curriculum we have for those grades. The curriculum has been mapped to next gen science standards and all of that is up on our website as well. So you can see if there's a particular lesson that you're interested in teaching, but obviously it needs to align to the standards you'll be able to see what standards map on to each of our different curriculum lessons. We also have family activities for pre-K through eighth graders, and those can be used at home with families. They can also be used in the educational setting. They tend to be a little bit more one-off, like one-pager activities rather than a full curriculum. Uh, but again, can be used in an educational setting as well. And some of the work that we've been doing lately is orienting our educational program to engage more college and high school learners. We found that this is a really wonderful sweet spot for students because high school and college classes often are doing independent projects. They are learning about student data collection, data analysis, how to do an actual science project, all of which works really well with Budburst. And they have oftentimes a semester or a year to pursue those projects. And in that time frame, it works really well, especially with our phonology project, to see change over time for younger learners or for students that only have one or two sessions looking at a plant that can still be valuable in getting them outside and paying attention to the nature on their school's campus. But for students that are able to watch a plant for a full semester and see how the plant goes from dormancy in the winter to having flowers by the time they're leaving for summer, it can be a really excellent opportunity to get the students connected to nature and really paying attention to the details and also learning about data collection over the course of many months, which is how real data collection happens. And it's, it's a real science project that they get to participate in. So really great opportunities if you're connected to high school or college, or you know folks that are, again, please think of us, get in touch with us. We would love for Budburst to be used in more classrooms this way. The last piece that I wanna mention briefly is how to become a Budburst partner. I know we've got some folks that are partners on this call, so very happy to have you here. Uh, basically, to become a Budburst partner, it is quite open-ended. It can be folks from other botanic gardens, community projects, state, local, or national parks, any nature center. It's, it's really quite open. 
um, basically an organization that would like to collect data with Budburst, you can fill out a pretty brief, just two page application to become a Budburst partner and collect data with us in this slightly more official capacity. Um, you would just collect data at your local site. We have pages on our website where we feature partners. There's an example here with Denver Botanic Gardens. It links to your site, just a brief summary of your organization, how you are participating in Budburst, and then some key plants that you're focused on monitoring at your site. And this can also be a really nice way for people in your state or in your area to know what plants might be of interest. So folks who visit our website and are looking at our partner pages can search by state. So for instance, you could search um, Colorado and Denver Botanic Gardens would pop up and then a user, even if they're not in Denver, would be able to see, oh, okay, well in Colorado, these 10 plants are of interest to Denver Botanic Gardens, so maybe I'll start looking at those plants. It can help guide people. Um, for our partners, they have access to some additional resources. So we have some data sheets that are, uh, they're kind of legacy data sheets, but our partners sometimes like them. So they have access to legacy data sheets. We also do a partner newsletter periodically to update partners. They get access to programming and training with us, with our staff. And also it's often who we go to if we have questions about uh, a feature or a resource. We usually talk with our partners first to see what they need or if something is working for them. So if you'd like to be involved at that level, becoming a partner is a really great way to do that with your organization. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in that, you can, I'll give you my email at the end of the call. And then the other piece I wanted to talk about is our technology. So Budburst relaunched our website in 2021. We can be found at budburst.org. And these are some of the resources that we've talked about that you'll see up on the site. We have activities for groups, and these are oftentimes more for uh, adults, like maybe a neighborhood organization or a group of volunteers. You might do something like adopting a trail or doing a phenology bio blitz in your location. And then we also have curriculum for students. So here's an example from our high school curriculum, different ways that uh, educators can use Budburst in their classroom. And then the other piece that we were able to do in 2021 was building a phone app. So we have a mobile app that anybody can use on your phone. Uh, I'll have QR codes up on the next screen. So all you need to do is search Budburst in your app store. This works for both iOS and Android. And one of the really cool features we have is an in-app plant identification tool. So this is in collaboration with iNaturalist, who you may have heard of. They do biodiversity surveys globally. And in their app, they have a plant ID. Well, ID is more than plants for them. They have an identification tool in their mobile app. We were able to work with them to have the same tool in our mobile app. So now when you snap a picture of something, it will give you some species suggestions. A couple caveats with that is that the ID tool works best on flower blossoms. It does not work as well on tree bark or leaves. So be quite wary of the recommendations from those things. And also check the flower blossom information. So it is not 100% flawless. It still definitely requires a human perspective to vouch for the recommendations. When you, for instance, click in, you can see um, in one of these examples, you can see the 10 species suggestions. You can click into those and read information about the species and see if it matches up with what you're looking at. So still ground truth them. Uh, a lot of times we have folks that are a little apprehensive or nervous to start making budburst observations. And for those people, we just recommend start with something that you do know. So if there's a tree in your neighborhood that you know is definitely X species, start with that plant. Start with something that you definitely can ID and go from there. Um, 
you don't have to you don't have to learn every plant species in order to participate you can just do it with the plants that you know and learn as you go okay here are the qr codes i'll leave this up for a minute so you can snap a picture i also will there's another screen that has them again so this won't be your last chance i'm just vamping while you take your time uh snapping a picture I'll also give you another opportunity in a few minutes. So like I said, you can get this in the Apple App Store or Google Play. Okay, and then very briefly, I'm going to walk you through what it might look like to actually make an observation. Like I mentioned, some folks are apprehensive they don't want to start the project for fear that they're going to do something wrong. So we found that walking through how to make an observation can just lower that barrier a little bit so that you know what you're getting into and hopefully feel a little more comfortable doing it. So this is how you would first sign up for the app if you don't have it already. It's free to sign up. You just need your email address. Um, for folks that might be doing this with younger learners, if you are 13, if you are above 13, you can use the app uh, on your own. If you have folks that are 13 or under, they have to use it with a parent, guardian, teacher to use their email address. Um, and this is once you get into the app. You will have a blank screen that says you don't have any observations. You can either click the neon green start an observation button or the camera icon in the dead center at the bottom, and that will start you on your path to making an observation. So you'll snap a picture and then you will see these species suggestions pop up powered by iNaturalist. You can click into um, one of those and read about the plant. So we have some overview information where you might see this plant like what state it's in and some identification hints to help you and if it doesn't look right you can go back and read about another one and if it's not in any of this top 10 if you scroll to the bottom you'll be able to search for the species yourself if you know what it is you can search by common name or scientific name and then you will click add an observation and then you have three different options here and these should map on to the three projects we talked about native ours isn't here on its own because it's essentially a subset of the pollinators project so that's why you're only seeing those first three we talked about for the milkweeds and monarchs banner that will be grayed out or non-selectable unless you're looking at a milkweed plant. So if you're looking at a milkweed plant and a Sclepias species, then you can select that. Then you'll add some information about where the plant is located. And one thing to note here is that when you download the app, it'll ask you to enable location services. That's for this feature. And if you don't allow location services, the app may not work very well. So if you've had trouble with the app, that might be something to look into. If location services are enabled, it should work pretty smoothly. If you've said no, no location services, you might, it might be buggy for you. So something to note, um, and that's what it's used for. It's just used for uh, knowing where your phone is when you took that picture of that plant. And then we have a feature where you can nickname a plant. This is private to you. Nobody else sees your nicknames and it's optional. And this is essentially most useful if you have a plant that you're going to see over and over again. So the example I gave earlier on about your backyard cherry tree, that might be a plant you would nickname. And you could say my backyard cherry tree. And again, no one else sees that. So if you say it's in your yard, no one else is going to be able to see that it's in your yard. So don't worry about that. Um, the nickname feature is most useful for plants you'll see repeatedly because you can add uh, more information, more observations to them more quickly. If, for instance, you're seeing a plant out on a hike that you're never going to see again, you can nickname it for fun, but it probably won't be that useful to you because you won't see that plant again, you won't make another observation on it. And then you'll enter the date which you made your observation you can select through on the calendar and then we get into actually adding the data 
So right here, we're doing an example for the phenology project. And we're looking at a plant that has flowers, leaves, and then I didn't put fruit on here, but you would see a wheel for fruit as well. And all you have to do is tell us what are the flowers doing? You'll select one of those dots around this wheel. If you click into one of those dots, a definition will pop up under the wheel. So if you're not sure what the difference is between first bud or bud burst, as you select that dot, it will tell you what the definition is. So again, we designed this to be something you could learn about as you go. You don't have to be an expert before you start participating. So again, don't, don't worry about it. You can learn as you're doing the project. It's designed to be pretty accessible for folks to learn as you're doing it. You can add a close-up photo of the flowers, of the buds. You don't have to, those are optional. And you also don't have to fill in every wheel. Uh, it's certainly helpful if you're already looking at the plant to just give us more information. But if you're just, oh, I just noticed the flowers, but I didn't pay attention to if there were fruits or if there were what the leaves were doing, you can just fill in the flower wheel and you don't have to do the other ones. Um, the other thing I'll mention here is that telling us that you've got none, like no flowers, that is still important data for us. So you can make observations on plants throughout the winter time, even when they're dormant and they don't, they're not doing anything particularly interesting. That's still information. So um, if you don't see flowers, but you think it's useless to write in that none dot, it's, that's not the case. It's still good data for us. It essentially gives us um, a baseline to know when, when they don't have flowers versus when they start getting flowers. Okay, and then after you have submitted your observation, uh, you'll be able to see little plant cards in the mobile app. And you can see in this example, all those dots are someone who's made a lot of observations. If you're just getting started, you might not see as many. And you can flip through these plant cards by scrolling left and right, or in the upper right hand corner, you can switch from the map view to a list view, and then you can scroll through your list more quickly. And like I mentioned, for the nickname plants, you will see a little camera icon on one of these cards, and you'll be able to quickly add another observation to it since it's theoretically a plant you're going to see frequently over and over again. So again, here's an opportunity to take a picture of the QR codes. And again, you just have to search bud burst. It should pop right up. So just to wrap up how you might interact with Budburst, how you can contribute to Budburst is obviously to contribute data. We would love to have your data on any of these projects, um, especially the pollinators or milkweeds and monarchs. We need more data on those projects from across the country. So anything you wanna give us there is fabulous. You can also analyze the data either just for fun or if you are an educator, or you're a researcher, maybe you're a grad student, any way you want to use the data, we would love for you to do it and let us know if you're using the data. If you do science education or you're doing science communication in a more informal way, maybe you're a Girl Scout troop leader or maybe you have a neighborhood organization, Budburst is a great project to do with groups like that. Uh, and if you're a partner, we can have you collecting data at a larger scale, which we would, of course, love to have. And then depending on your organization, you can use Budburst for science communication and community engagement at your place as well. Uh, and then I have this graphic up, but at this point, a lot of these information, this data is a little bit old. So at this point, we have uh, over 200,000 data points collected. We have almost 30,000 registered users and uh, while well, some of this is still the same, we're still in all 50 states uh, and we've got over 40 partner organizations working with us, but we've got a lot of folks working on Budburst and uh, in a diffuse capacity and we would love to have you join us. And then quickly, I just wanna acknowledge that I'm giving you the talk today, but there are a lot of folks who also work on this project. So the full-time Budburst team is myself, and Dr. Sarah Jones and Taryn Lichtenberger, our education manager is Sarah, and Taryn is our community engagement manager. 
And then we also have two co-PIs who work on the project, uh, Dr. Kay Havens and Dr. Jennifer Schwartz. And this uh, team is actually, we have a few additional folks who are on our team now. Uh, this slide is a little bit old. So we have a principal web developer, Owen Zengel, who's not featured here. And then we have two folks that are joining us for the summer. Our community liaison is Amenya Valdez. And then we have an intern who's joining us, Tyler Stewart. So we have folks here over the summer as well as full time throughout the year. Uh, happy to help you with all of your Bud Burst questions. And speaking of which, I'm happy to take questions. We've got a little less than 10 minutes and that QR code will take you to our website and you are welcome to email us at info at budburst.org for any questions you don't ask here, but happy to take questions from folks. Feel free to unmute. I, I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This, that sure. Um, I'm calling on my phone. Um, uh, two things, actually. My first thing was about using photographs. Um, so I have a small teaching garden with a pollinator habitat. And um, so I take tons of pictures, but um, my phone gets pretty hot out there, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't like, uh, I would typically add the photos later. Mm -hmm. Do you know, or can somebody find somebody that you have the GPS location coming off the picture, or is it coming off where I am when I? That is such a good question. And I feel like I have tested this before, but I'm not remembering the answer. I think that it comes from your photo information. So it should still be accurate if you, for instance, upload the photos um, later from a different location. But I'm not yeah, positive. It had a lot more um, digits in the app than it did in the metadata for the picture, mm -hmm. but I didn't know whether there, that's because it's rounding somehow when it shows it to me or. Yeah. So, um, okay, because it, yeah. it would make it a lot more complicated if I had to pick the location over and over and over again. Yes. Um, that's true. One thing I will say is that you can change the location. So if it does, uh, if it does it incorrectly and it you upload the photo from a different place and it plops you in the wrong location, you can move that little pin. Um, but yeah, I, I know. I'm just, it, I'm just more likely to make observations if I don't have to do that. Um, and then my only other thing, I, I am really, really interested in. I've been doing. Um, some of my own curricular stuff with college students, and um, I'd be really interested in talking to somebody about ideas. Um, I can't, my institution is much bigger than me, and I am not associated with any of the agricultural or botanic gardens on campus, so I can't commit to that, but I would really like to talk to somebody about uh, stuff. I have used the younger stuff with mm -hmm. elementary education majors. So, um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That we can definitely get you more info. If you're, it sounds, you said you're on your phone. If you're able to put your email in the chat, I will copy okay. it. Can you see my name? Yes. It's just my last name at msu.edu. Okay. That's easy. I will follow up with you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? <laughs> 